I think we're right to get going. Uh, I've got the thumbs up. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's lovely to see you here this morning. Um, begin our time together with a quote from John chapter 1. The Word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. From his abundance we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Let's say together this prayer of thankfulness. Dear God, thank you that Jesus is the King over all your creation. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross in our place so that we can be your people. Please help us to follow Jesus as our King and be obedient to you. Amen. We can be sure of his forgiveness and love. This is from Colossians 2. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It's good news. Our first song this morning is Spirit Song. The announcements for today. Uh, many of the ministries of the church are continuing but are online rather than meeting in person. Uh, today, uh, 2.30 to 3.30 this afternoon, the men will be meeting on Zoom. Uh, that Bible passage and some questions for discussion have been sent out uh, to the guys who've indicated they wish to join that group. Uh, anybody else? Um, that is, any other guys, not ladies, uh, who want to join that group, uh, please do contact me and I will send out uh, those contact details and questions. Uh, just a reminder, Peter Reynolds' group, uh, Bible study group, is still meeting on Friday nights, 7.30 to 8.30. 
contact Peter Reynolds for the Zoom uh, contact details. That's Friday nights 7.30 to 8.30. Um, a big thank you to those who have been contributing financially to the church. Uh, we haven't been getting the money from our hall hirers, so our budget is down. Uh, so we're very grateful for those who have been generous in supporting uh, the ongoing ministries of the church by making deposits into our bank account. So if you need those account details, please contact myself or Young Min or at the church bank account. Uh, there will be a congregation meeting on a Sunday the 29th of August, beginning at midday. Um, this is an extra meeting for the purpose of approving the church's application to take money from our trust fund uh, to support uh, Jung Mi in her ministry and uh, to support her in her application for uh, her uh, permanent residency visa. Uh, this was all approved early last year but the amounts have changed because of the details of negotiation with trustees. Um, so the final amounts approved are different to the draft amounts. So we need a congregation meeting uh, to approve uh, taking that money from the trust account. So that's the end of this month, uh, the 29th of August. If the stay-at-home order is lifted, it will be a combination of Zoom and people in the church. If the stay-at-home is extended, it will be exclusively on Zoom. So that's the end of this month, the 29th. So those are all of the announcements. Um, so we go to item number six in our order of service. This is our first Bible reading a quote from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. It will not be taken away from her. Here ends the reading. May God bless us through the reading of his word. We're at item number seven. Today we're going to be praying for Steve and Naomi Lilly, uh, who work with Wycliffe Bible Translators. Their language group is a people in Nepal, um, but they are now based in Australia and are continuing translation work and uh, um, preparing Bible studies. And they are using modern technology of uh, iPhones and other internet accessible things uh, to distribute God's word freely. So let's uphold them in prayer. This is item number seven in our order of service. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation, Australia, and for the state and federal governments. We ask, Lord God, that you would so guide our nation that we may continue in safety and freedom to share the good news of Jesus Christ. May we do so openly and without persecution. We pray for Steve and Naomi Lilly, who serve with Wycliffe Bible Translators. We thank you, Lord, for the release of the latest version of the Ladakhi Bible, on Google Play, and we pray that it will also be available soon on iStore. We pray that you will guide and bless the work of preparing the Bible studies on Mark and Genesis. We pray that you will keep Steve and Naomi safe as they travel to many churches over the next few months. 
May the churches be encouraged as they hear stories of your word changing the lives of people in remote villages. We praise you, Lord God, for the joy your people have at reading your holy word in their own language. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our second Bible reading is 1 Timothy 5, beginning at verse 17. Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. And in another place, those who work deserve their pay. Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Those who sin should be reprimanded in front of the whole church. This will serve as a strong warning to others. I solemnly command you in the presence of God and Jesus Christ and the highest angels to obey these instructions without taking sides or showing favoritism to anyone. Never be in a hurry to appoint a church leader. Do not share in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Don't drink water only only don't drink only water. You ought to drink a little wine for the sake of your stomach because you are sick so often. Here ends the reading. May God bless us through the reading of his word. We now have our children's talk and children's song. Our children's talk today is God brings good out of tough times. Genesis chapter 42. Back in Canaan, where Joseph had come from, Joseph's family was running out of food because of the famine. No rain and no food. But in Egypt, thanks to Joseph, Everyone had plenty of food. Joseph's father, Jacob, said to his sons, Why are you just sitting here? There's food in Egypt. Go and buy some so we won't starve to death. So ten of the brothers went, but not their little brother, Benjamin. Jacob was scared something might happen if Benjamin went away. Now that Joseph was gone, Benjamin was his favorite. When the brothers arrived in Egypt and asked to buy food, guess who they were sent to? The one in charge, of course, Joseph. Joseph knew who they were straight away, but he pretended he didn't know them. He was much older now and dressed in his rich Egyptian clothes, so they didn't recognize him. Joseph's brother bowed to Joseph and asked for food. He asked them, where do you come from? From the land of Canaan, we've come here to buy grain, they answered. Joseph remembered his dreams from when he was a boy. So he said, you, you are spies. You've come here to find out where our country is weak. They told him they were brothers and their little brother and father were still at home. But Joseph pretended he didn't believe them. He asked them, Bring your little brother here, then I will believe you. We can't do that. Our father would never let him come, the brothers said. Joseph told them, you must bring your youngest brother to me. Then I will know that you are telling the truth. 
Joseph's brothers agreed and said to one another, "We are being punished because of what we did to Joseph. That's why these terrible things are happening." Reuben spoke up. Didn't I tell you not to harm the boy? But you wouldn't listen, and now we have to pay the price for killing him. Joseph took one brother, Simeon, as a prisoner until the others returned with Benjamin. He gave them food to take back to their father. This is terrible, the brothers said to each other. They didn't know that even when bad things happen, God can bring good out of tough times. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Joseph's story. Help us to trust you bring good out of tough times. Lead us to trust you as you work with us. In Jesus' name, Amen. We have children's song. Children's song is creation song. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. On day number one, God made light. He made the day and He made the night. On day number two, God made the sky. It's big and blue and way up high. Whoa. Day number three, God made the sea. He made the land, every plant and tree. On day number four, God made the stars. He put the sun in the sky, super duper far. Whoa, whoa. God made you and God made me. He made everyone and everything we see. He made. On day number five, God made birds and fish, dolphins and whales, and things that go squish. On day number six, God made animals and bugs, foxes and cubs, all for us to hug. Whoa. Whoa. On day number six, God also made man. He said it was good and part of his plan. On day number seven, God stopped. To rest, he saw what he made. It was his best. Whoa. Our second song is "Power of Your Love." Lord, I come to you.
item number 12. This is a part of the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 13, that deals with sanctification, uh, which is the work of God in his people by the Holy Spirit, helping us to become more godly, more Christ-like. A Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 13, parts 2 and 3. Sanctification is throughout the whole person, yet imperfect in this life, because some remnants of corruption still remain in every part of the person from which a continual and irreconcilable war arises, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. In this war, Although the remaining corruption may prevail for a time, yet, through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part of the person wins. So the saint grows in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Right, item number 13, a quote from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Our passage for today is uh, from 1 Timothy 5. We've already read a part of it. Uh, we're continuing the reading from verse 24 through to 6.3. Uh, in today's talk, we're not dealing with all of the things in our passage. There are some bits we're uh, jumping over, um, but the plan is to look at them next week. But let's uh, continue our reading in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 24. Remember the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious, and the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. All slaves should show full respect for their masters, so that they will not bring shame on the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. Teach these things, Timothy, and encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teachings, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the teachings that you give us. You haven't left us to work out for ourselves what it means to know you and love you and obey you. And we thank you for the lessons learnt in the early church that are the same lessons that we also need to learn. We do pray, Father, that you would guide us and give us understanding and help us, Father, to put into practice what it means to be your children. And these things we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Teach these things, Timothy. Encourage everyone to obey them. Some people may contradict our teachings, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. If we hired an advertising company to promote the Christian faith, they would most likely tell us to remove words like wholesome and godly from the Bible. You need to use words like exciting, challenging and adventurous, they would probably tell us. Wholesome and godly are boring ideas, they might say. Now, I can only speak for myself, but I must confess that the biggest challenge I face each day is to be godly. 
My most difficult problem is to listen to and obey the wholesome teachings of my Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. For he forces me to struggle and strain in the fight to overcome my own sinful nature and win a great victory. Do you want a life filled with a noble quest, a great adventure that is worth the time, energy and effort required to achieve success? Well, then become a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ, risen from the grave, commissioned his early followers, telling them to go and make disciples of all the nations. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listening to the teachings of Jesus Christ and obey his teachings, are not optional extras to the Christian life. Christian faith is not like buying a new car where you might decide to not get the options package of tinted windows, floor mats, or heated leather seats. There is only one variety of the Christian faith, and it comes with the love, mercy, and grace of God. It comes with forgiveness and a joyful eternal life with our Creator. And it comes with the call to trust, follow and obey our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. A daily walk of faith and obedience may not sound very exciting, but it is the strong foundation for a real life. And there are great benefits in this life and the next. Now Christians, like most people, are attracted to the big and showy projects. But it is the daily, consistent effort invested in maintaining and steadily growing our love for God that provides joy, contentment and purpose in your life. Have you ever noticed that the politicians in local government love to have their picture in the newspaper or on television? They don't get their photo taken for... Sorry, the sound has dropped out. Here. Right. They don't get their photo taken for fixing some small holes in local roads. They're on the front page of the newspaper for opening a new town hall or some other big project. But most local residents don't really care about a new and fancy town hall. They want their streets and footpaths kept in good condition and the local parks clean and safe for their families to play in. It is these daily, ordinary things that provide a good quality of life for most families, not multi-million dollar, architect-designed, award-winning new council offices. And it is these ordinary things like roads, footpaths and parks that need consistent time and effort to keep them in good condition. But the effects of neglect are only seen over a period of time. Now, in the same way, Christians need to put in daily time and effort to listen to and obey the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus, which promote a godly life. When Jesus visited the home of his friends Martha and Mary, Martha was super busy with all the work needed for providing suitable hospitality for Jesus and his disciples. But Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his teachings. Now Martha was understandably upset and said to Jesus, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here While I do all the work, tell her to come and help me. Now Jesus' reply is an important message for we Christians today. He said, 
My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. It will not be taken away from her. In the busyness of our lives, do we make time to stop and sit at our Lord's feet and carefully listen to his words? Or are we so worried and upset over the common problems of life that what should be first becomes last? Reading the Bible, spending quality time alone in prayer and genuine supportive fellowship with God's people are essentials for every Christian believer. Neglect these necessary things and over time it will have inevitable effects. Weeds will slowly fill the garden of your life. I struggle with the bad habit of doing my required daily Bible reading for the purpose of ticking it off my to-do list. I then quickly move on to the next task to be achieved that day. That is not sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him speak to me. Listening to and obeying Jesus needs time and purposeful effort. I know I have a problem when I can find half an hour to watch my favourite television show or read an enjoyable novel, but I can't find time to sit quietly alone with God with my Bible open. The discipline of reading my Bible and prayer doesn't just happen. I have to make it happen. Now, our, our goal is to have a godly life filled with the love, joy, peace, patience and kindness that God alone can produce in us. But that is a difficult journey. As Jesus said, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for all the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow. The road is difficult. Only a few ever find it. Paul knows that the churches need strong guidance and encouragement to find and stay on God's good but narrow path. So he told his young co-worker Timothy, the purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, a genuine faith. A little later in his letter he wrote, Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battles. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their consciences. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. Now, I've heard that many Olympic athletes will spend some quiet time alone before their event, getting their mind focused on the task ahead. They will think through their training and their hard work with the purpose of preparing themselves to compete well. But if all they do is sit alone and think about their event, they'll never win a medal. They need to engage in the battle and compete to win. The same is true of our Christian walk of faith. Time alone with God and his word is essential preparation. But he calls us to go out and fight in the Lord's battles. So Paul has already told Timothy to take a strong stand against false teachers who are leading some church members away from the true faith in Christ. And he's told men to deal with their problems with anger. He's told women to stop valuing themselves by their outward beauty. 
He's guided Timothy through the proven qualities of godliness needed for church leaders. And he's taught about the gentle and respectful way to correct a brother or sister in Christ when they're going the wrong way. And Paul has given wise advice on how to care for the poor and widows in the church. He's been realistic about the problems of gossip and meddling in other people's business that so easily come when faithful believers have too much time on their hands. And now he deals with the difficult problem of a church leader who sins. Now Paul's advice is the same as the rules for the Old Testament people of God. You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Deuteronomy 19. Now we should not believe every bit of rumour and gossip about a fellow Christian's life. For our Lord Jesus was accused of gross sin because he dealt patiently and kindly with sinners instead of quickly judging and condemning them. The pastor of a church in Burwood was often seen talking with some young women before their Sunday evening church service. One of the church members found out that the young women worked in an immoral massage parlour. The rumour quickly went around the church that the pastor was involved in immoral relations with these women. But the truth was that these young women were seeking for something to change their miserable lives. And they were seriously looking at Jesus, wondering if he could really forgive and accept them. Gossip quickly destroys a person's reputation. Facts never get in the way of a good bit of gossip. So our Lord Jesus teaches us, when a fellow believer sins against you, you go to them privately in order to bring repentance and reconciliation. If they won't listen to you, then you take two or three witnesses from the church to confront them with their wrong. And Paul advises that when a church leader sins, they should be rebuked publicly. Now again, Paul is drawing on his knowledge of God's laws. The rest of the people will hear about it, be afraid to do such an evil thing, Deuteronomy 19.20. Now Jesus openly confronted the Jewish leaders for their sins of hypocrisy and greed. And Paul confronted Peter because he was dividing the church into separate Jewish and Gentile groups. Paul wrote, But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. So we balance our desire for peace, repentance and reconciliation with the reality that sin by church leaders needs to be exposed and confronted. When some false teachers were trying to lead the Corinthian churches away from Paul and the gospel of Jesus that he preached, he wrote to them, saying, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ. Though I realize you think I'm a timid person and bold only when I'm far away. Well, I am begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. Those people should realize that our actions when we arrive in person will be as forceful as what we say in our letters from far away. See, Paul, like our Lord Jesus, always wanted to do what was best for the Christian believers under his care. Whether it was a gentle word of encouragement or confronting a sinner to his face 
all was done for the glory of Christ and the good of the church. Well, not every sin done by Christian believers will be exposed in this life. And not every good deed done quietly by generous and loving Christians will be known in this life. Paul told Timothy, Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. In the same way, the good deeds of some people are obvious, and the good deeds done in secret will someday come to light. Jesus tells us that we should not do good deeds for the purpose of receiving recognition and praise by other people. The God does not do good to us because he needs our thanks or approval. He does good to us because he genuinely and deeply loves us and cares for us. And the sufferings of Christ remind us just how much we are loved by our Creator. If we desire to be godly and we listen to the wholesome teachings of our Lord Jesus, then he will help us to also do good from a pure and honest heart. If we never receive thanks in this life for our good deeds, it doesn't matter. God knows and is pleased with the efforts of his children. And the evil done by some believers is never exposed in this life. But God sees it, and that is a terrifying thought. It is far better to be confronted with your sin now. For then you have the opportunity for confession, repentance and forgiveness. The minister of a large church here in Sydney had a very successful ministry. Many of our students for Christian ministry were sent to his church to be mentored and trained by him. He was a popular speaker at Christian conferences. He taught some subjects at our main Bible college. But then God confronted him. He was having an immoral relationship with a young woman in his church. God's rebuke brought him to humble repentance. What is the point of having a successful Christian ministry If your heart is not right with your creator and judge. But Jesus said, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. Active involvement in church is meaningless without an active pursuit of godliness. As Paul says, teach these things and encourage everyone to obey them. These are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus. These teachings promote a godly life. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are saved by your grace alone. It is not something our good deeds can ever earn. But we also thank you, Heavenly Father, that you love us so much that even in this life you want us to change so that we can be more like you and like your Son, our Lord Jesus. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll help us to sit at Jesus' feet, to not just fill our minds with the right information, but to humbly listen and be transformed and changed. We pray, Heavenly Father, that each day we will grow in the grace and love of you, our Lord, and your Son, our Saviour. 
We pray these things in your Son's mighty name. Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.